as we get going here in Daniel chapter 6, the first thing that is really important for us to understand is, and I talked about this last week, um, Babylon has been overtaken by the Medes and the Persians, led uh, by Cyrus the king, uh, but we see this name, Darius the Mede. And we were introduced to that last week, and we're not sure if that is a specific title or name uh, given to uh, the general whose name was Guberu, who led the charge and defeated Babylon. We don't know if Cyrus uh, put him in charge for a while or if this is actually another name for Cyrus. Okay, so we don't know specifically that yet, um, and, but we do know that, that the Darius we're talking about is not a Darius that, is, uh, that we learn about in, in history later on called Darius the first. Okay, that either means something to you or you're like, I didn't really care, but uh, there you go. Daniel chapter 6 verse 1, it says this, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. Now, usually after a conquest has taken place like this, the new ruler would reorganize the government of the conquered kingdom to establish his own authority and leadership. Okay, in other words, there's a change in direction. I am now the lead, and, and, and his goal is to get everyone as quickly as possible to align in how he wants to run the kingdom. Now, For Darius, it was absolutely impossible to have his hand in everything and to make sure uh, there weren't any revolts happening or that his money was still coming in and all of that. So uh, what he does is he appoints officers that he could trust to make sure that the work was being done. Now, during this process, Darius very quickly found out about Daniel. He learned about Daniel. Daniel uh, was somebody that, that he found was was incredibly not only honest but had integrity, incredible wisdom and knowledge and discernment. And so Daniel is appointed to be one of these three high officials over the entire kingdom. And these three men were going to manage the other 120 leaders who ruled over the provinces. And and even in this small group of three that Daniel is hand-selected for by the king, who and they only reported to the king, Daniel distinguishes himself from those other two individuals to the point where the king is planning on making Daniel the number one in authority just under him, over the whole kingdom. What a difference between this king and the previous king. Because last week I talked about Belshazzar and how he had Daniel available to him um, and known about the stories that involved Daniel and yet refused to bring him in until it was too late. And we see this, this king do things differently. He's able to identify Daniel and to bring him in and to leverage him and give him this seed of incredible influence and power. Now, when the other leaders heard about this, because information just seems to leak all the time, they hear about this. They are filled with jealousy, anger. This guy is is being promoted above all of us. And so we see when they find this out that then they seek to find something wrong with Daniel in his life. 
in his character, his ethics, all these things. And as they go to find and they start digging into his life, they go, we can't find anything wrong with this guy. Now, what's so neat about this is you want to talk about a living testimony to what he actually believed. And I want you to just think for a second about if if somebody wanted to prove that our faith was a fraud or that we were a fraud, and they started going through your phone. Maybe they started going, they grabbed your computer. Maybe they started talking to your coworkers, your classmates, your friends, the people you live with, your family. What would they find out? And we see that Daniel was not just this public Christian. It was who he was. It was who he was in private. And we see that his faith, his lifestyle aligned with his belief and his understanding of who God was. And, and so they, they, they literally are filled with jealousy. And jealousy is a very dangerous thing. If jealousy is in your life right now, I plead with you to remove it, to deal with it right now. Because it will take you down a road that you never intended to go down. You will have thoughts that you never knew you would think about. And you will end up acting upon something that, that you, could, you could never comprehend or, or think that you would do. And we see, we see in the Old Testament, a prime example of this is Joseph, the crazy colored coat, his brothers and what they do to him out of jealousy. And so we've got to guard ourselves against this. Against this. And so we see that, that they can't attack his character, so they go after his faith. They knew Daniel prayed in his home three times each day with the windows open uh, toward Jerusalem. And so their idea was if, if the king made prayer to other gods illegal, then Daniel could be caught. And so these government officials, they assembled together to meet with the king. No doubt the king is, is honored that, that these government officials would want to meet with him. And, 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 and we see that Daniel's not there but because the, the leaders are very careful not to include Daniel. And so they go and they meet before the king. He's not there, but they deceptively included him in their speech to the king. Did you catch that? They're claiming that all the high officials had agreed on this plan that they're presenting to Darius. So Daniel's not there strategically, but they're also presenting this idea to the king. And they're saying that all of us are unified in this idea that we're presenting to you. And so they're trying to give this impression uh, of, of something that's not even true. And, and they knew that Darius is trying to unify this kingdom as quickly as possible. And what better way, king, to unify the kingdom than to, to create a law where nobody for 30 days can worship and pray to anybody but you, king. They can't cry out to, to any other gods. You're the focus, king, for a whole month. And, and king... We care so deeply about this, all of us, that anybody who disobeys this law gets put into this den of lions. You know, their flattery just feeds the king's pride. And he agrees. And not only does he have this law written, but he signs it. And once it's signed, this law could not be changed or nullified. You know, it's been said that uh, flattery is manipulation, not communication. And, and, and you know, and, and we see that in, in his pride, Darius gives in to this flattery from these evil leaders. We have to be very, very careful who we listen to. You have to be very uh, cautious and really consider what and who you're going to choose to believe. Because, you know, like, and we have to guard our hearts because when it's really dangerous is when someone's telling me something I really want to hear about me. Right? Like, that's when it's really dangerous. And that's what flattery really is. It's, it's, it's people telling or somebody communicating something to you or about you and you actually want to hear it so you like it. And you would hope someone would think this about you. So when you hear it, you have to guard your heart because you're going to like what you're hearing. And it's even really or more dangerous when it comes from somebody who's a Christian because we will take the words coming from their mouth and because they're a Christian, we will immediately go, oh, those are the words from God's mouth. No. (laughs) 
And we get caught up in that. And if, and if you were the enemy trying to trap us, what would you do? You would feed a lie that we would want to hear, want to believe about ourselves. And all of a sudden, before this king knows it, he falls into this trap of pride, signs his highest leader, the one he cares the most about, he signs his death warrant. You know, how quickly this, this pride seeped in and removed his filter system for a good decision. And you need to be very careful because you could actually be operating uh, in a way that pleases and honors God and, 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 and have these incredible people into your life. Like the king had, had elevated. He did everything he should. Put Daniel in this seat where that's his counsel. But literally in a split second, Daniel's not there. He's being lied to. He's liking what he hears. And all of a sudden, he falls into this trap just like that. You need to understand and know that the enemy wants you to hear something you like and then make a decision where you don't consult the Bible about. You don't consult the people that are going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear because they're going to tell you God's truth. And, and so the enemy is going to try and get you to make this decision as quickly as possible because he knows if you make a reactionary decision like this, it's not going to be a good one. And so we see the king fall into this. And then in Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, it says, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, and nothing, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. So Daniel uh, has this pattern established where, where he, he goes to the Lord, and, and really it's, uh, it's in alignment with what Solomon talks about in 1 Kings chapter 8, where, where literally they established how their people would pray towards uh, God's temple. And, and, and then we see this three times a day pattern, which David had instituted in, in Psalm 55. And, and so Daniel does this faithfully every day, window toward where the temple would be, because remember, uh, they had destroyed that and and then he prays these specific three times and and what we see is that Daniel had a choice right he knew the new law it says he knew that it was written down and so he could have he could have uh, you know compromised right found excuses for not maintaining his faithful prayer life Right? He, like, like we, hear, we hear these verses, um, you know, about how God will, will make a way out, right? Whatever temptation in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 13, how, how God will pre create a way of escape. You'll never be tempted beyond your ability uh, to handle that, and God will, will provide this way out. Here's the, the, the scary thing. The enemy also provides a way out when you're tempted. And his way out is always the easiest. And so Daniel has a choice, Right? And, and, so, and so he knows the law, and, and we see that, that, like, he could have closed his windows. I'm like, I mean, if it was me, like, let's just close the windows. No one, you know, God sees my heart. 
you know, close the windows or, you know, I could just pray silently. You know, God knows. I don't need to verbalize it, you know, and so I'll just pray silently for a few days here, you know, or, or I'll just wait till this month's over. I'll go pray somewhere out in the country, you know, and, and I'll be fine and, I, and, I'll, and I'll maintain. But we see that Daniel obeyed God above all else. See, remember that law is, is, is you can't pray to your God. You can't do that. And so, so Daniel, Daniel knew that to not do that was in opposition to what God had told him to do. And so, and so, and, and what we see here is an important, important truth. Because I, I hear uh, a lot that, that outlook uh, determines outcome. And I hear it, I see it posted and all that, and it's like this good like, self-motivation thing. And uh, the problem is I've seen a lot of people with great outlooks not have positive outcomes. And so we look at this and it's like rah, rah, but then all of a sudden I had the right outlook, outlook towards life or towards the situation, but the outcome didn't align with my outlook. So what happened? I'm going to tell you right now, that's not true. The only time it's true is when my outlook is fixated and focused on the truth and reality of who God is. And when that is the basis of my outlook, guess what? My outcome is safe and secure because that's God's will. And so the only time that's true is when God is the source and the definition of my outlook. When I daily wake up and go, God, my outlook is you. My outlook is not. What is this day going to give me? What can I get from it? But God, you're the focus of my outlook. And so by, as a byproduct of that, whatever happens today, whatever happens next week, whatever happens two years from now, God, it is the outcome that is in alignment with your will. And therefore, I don't have to fear and I can have peace in that. And we see that was Daniel's life. That was the basis of his outlook. And so we see whatever the outcome was, it was within the, the framework of God's will. And he was okay with that. Daniel lived out Philippians 4, 6, and 7 where it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, he had walked with God for over 70 years. Okay? He walked with God for over 70 years, and, and, and he had all of this, these situations and, and scenarios and, and moments that he could look back upon and see the faithfulness of God in his life. Like, like I want to be very clear with us this morning, because um, do you realize that your greatest steps of faith with God could be towards the end of your life? You know, I, I hear this like, Steve, I'm retired. I'm like, good for you. <laughs> you made it. Or, or, you know, I used to do that. Or, or let me tell you about this time way back when at this church. You got to hear about this. It's like, awesome. Steve, my kids are all grown up. Good luck with that. Like, and we, and we almost take this, this mindset, and it's crazy how it's crept into Christianity, and it's literally like, like a professional athlete mindset where, where you have this short window of time, and like, like any professional athlete, they know they have this small window of time where they're at their peak, and so they try and prepare for that, and when they're at that peak, they try to get everything they can out of that peak, and when it's over, it's over, and they look back upon it, and they talk about it. Listen, that was not meant to leak into Christianity. Like, like that's, not, that's not the story. Like, you don't see Daniel, oh, yeah, king. Uh, like, he, he comes in. Listen, like, your best days could be ahead of you. And for those of you that are farther along in your years, like, like listen, like, like, God's best for you and some of the greatest moments of faith, you have yet to take them yet. They still can be out there, and you have so much to bring to pour into those of us who are literally trying to figure this whole thing out. And so we see, like, like in Scripture, you don't see people peak and then, oh, that was great. They were in their prime. And then they drop. No, you see them continue to climb in their relationship with God and what God does in their life. That's what he has for you. Isn't that encouraging? Some of you are like, oh, man. <laughs> That's exciting. We see that. Throughout our Bible, we see people really young ages doing incredible things for God, and we see people that 
are extremely old, doing incredible things for God. Like, that's all throughout our Bibles. And, you know, Daniel had a copy, had a copy of the prophecy of Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 32, 27, it says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? And so Daniel knew, he knew this. And the men who spied on Daniel hurried when they caught him, when they saw him. As soon as those windows opened, you just imagine them going, ha, ha, we got him. And so they go and they tell the king. And the king, notice the king is not angry. The king is distressed. He's distressed because literally the, the greatest help to him ruling this kingdom, who he trusted above anybody else, he had signed his death warrant. He's realizing that he had fallen into this trap. And if he had just consulted Daniel, this never would have happened. But we also see something about God because this probably needed to happen in order to actually reveal who were the frauds in his kingdom. And so by this actually happening, those people were brought to the surface. God knew what needed to happen. So we see the king, he wants to save Daniel from execution. For the entire day, Darius ignored all other things, all other matters with his kingdom, and he tried to free Daniel, but he couldn't. The law of the Medes and the Persians could not be annulled or changed, and as a result, Daniel's enemies are there with the king, just reminding him of the law, that he cannot change it, and the king calls for Daniel to be put in the lion's den. And we see this lion's den. It was a large pit that had a hole uh, on the top and, and somewhere either at the foot of a ramp or on the other side there was a doorway to let these lions in and that and we see that Daniel is lowered into this and even as he's lowered the king is saying God I, I, the God that you serve I pray that he delivers you. He's, I hope he delivers you and Daniel is put into this. And we see that Darius is restless. He's fasting. He refuses his nightly entertainment. He can't sleep. And he signs also his signet so that if anything happened, that it was evident. And it also sets the stage for everybody to know that nobody hijacked Daniel out of there. He was in there or they would have known. And in Daniel chapter 6, verse 19, it says this. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke, broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So Darius, he's had a horrible night. He hasn't been able to sleep, and he's hungry, and, and all of this. He, he, he runs quickly over to the lion's den and before he's even there he cries out to Daniel in anguish Daniel has the God you serve has has he has he healed you has he has he saved you uh, from from the lions and 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 Daniel responds oh king live forever maybe a little different response than I would have given the king but that's why I, I haven't gone through this test right um, oh king live forever And we look at this and we go, man, God could have just by his words, God could have closed the mouths of the lions. But we see something here 
that's really impactful. He chooses to send an angel to protect and to shut the mouth of the lions. And when we think about angels and their role and, and delivering, like, like we see in Psalm 34, 7, it says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Psalm 91, 11, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And so we see these angels and, and their role. And then, and then in the New Testament, we actually see uh, their impact on Jesus' life, in Jesus' ministry. And, and, and Jesus, as he's out being tempted in the wilderness, he's hungry, he's fasting, he's facing all these trials. And we see in Mark chapter 1, verse 13, and it says, And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. And then we see in the garden another intense situation. Jesus is sweating drops of blood. He knows he's got to go to the cross on behalf of all of us. And, and, and he's there and he's agonizing over this. And what does it say in Luke twenty two forty three? 43? It says, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. Now, here's what's so awesome about this. Like, like we literally, it says in Scripture, we have angels around us that are, that are, that are surrounding us, and, and we don't even know when we're entertaining them. And girls, if a guy says, you're my angel, just say, no, it's not happening. But they're all around us that God sends them to minister, to, to protect, to guide, to help strengthen us. And so I, why, why do I love this so much? Because I'll tell you what, one thing is this. A lot of these little storybooks, they like take the angel out or we don't talk about it and we just talk about like, oh, and Daniel's there and da-da-da-da. But we see in this story like how God doesn't just confront us with this opposition that's way bigger than us. What God also does is he always equips us to be able to walk through it and not only walk through it, but thrive in it. And in that moment where you can't get through it, because at church we talk about opposition a lot because it's real. But how often do we talk about how God supernaturally intervenes when you're in your opposition, if you are faithful to God, and he literally has angels available that were ministering to Jesus. To where Jesus is agonizing and he's got an angel like, you got this. There are moments in your life, and, and maybe some of you can even remember, and you're like, I don't know how I got through that. I don't know. Something changed. It's amazing to think how God intervenes to help you through that opposition, if you allow him to. In verse 23, we see that the Lord delivered Daniel because of his faith and because he was innocent of any crime before the king or any sin he had before the Lord. Now, I want to be very clear because we point to this and we just go, oh, God wants to heal you uh, just like that. And, and the reality is in Hebrews 11, we love talking about all the heroes of the faith and what God did there and all these incredible responses. But then we get to like, you know, verses uh, 36 and we go, oh where it just talks about all these things that happened to people, the others as they're called, who also had incredible faith, but they were not rescued from that. And so it's very dangerous to draw conclusions from consequences that we see. Because we, we see moments where God intervenes, and we see uh, also moments where, and it's really hard, when we see it doesn't get fixed. God could have prevented Daniel from going into the lion's den, but by allowing him to go in and bringing him out unhurt, the Lord received greatest honor. This is so important. God's greatest good came from Daniel going into the lion's den, not the removal of the lion's den. Do you understand that? Like, like, and this is big for us because we're like, hey, God. It may not be a physical lion's den, but there, there's something just like that, and you feel like that, and you're like, no, God, I pray for it to go away. God, remove that. God, that's an obstacle. That's not of you. God, like, take it away. And in reality, when we see this, God's greatest good was accomplished by actually Daniel being sent into the lion's den. Not the removal of it. And so for some of us, we need to understand that there are going to be situations or obstacles in your life or people, and you may look at them like that, and just maybe God's greatest good, not only for you but for him, may be accomplished by you willfully walking through that. And so don't fear from that. Don't run from that. Like, like yeah, I don't pray for a lion's den. Like, I don't go home and be like, hey, God, what an awesome thing. I just pray that 
that happens in my life. Like, no, I'm not saying pray for it, but I'm saying when those obstacles and those moments happen, you need to understand and know that, that God did not remove the lion's den. Daniel was dropped into the lion's den. And just maybe you're going to be called to go through it. But by being faithful, even in that, God's greatest good for you can be accomplished. You know, it may feel like you're being sentenced. It may feel like abandonment. It may feel like you're being punished for doing the right thing. It may look like this will end you. But if God allowed it, just maybe he's got a plan with it for your good. Darius throws the officers who accused Daniel and their families into the lion's den. Just in case you're wondering, oh, did Darius like figure out a way to feed the lions so they weren't hungry or maybe they drugged the animals? And, and so, no, these lions were hungry because those guys, didn't, they didn't even make it to the bottom before they are consumed. And Darius issues a decree to the whole empire that they should all show fear and reverence to the God of Daniel. Do you see what it says there, how powerful it is, this statement that is literally delivered all around the known empire about God and what God did with Daniel and rescuing him from the lion's den? Like, Like, it's trending. Everyone's talking about it. Like, it's so crazy to me because we see the Israelites who had, been, who had been literally taken. We see Jerusalem overthrown and because they had abandoned their God and, and, and because they wouldn't give praise to God. But now we see these pagan rulers uh, proclaiming and declaring praise to God. And now, as opposed to the Jews being a witness to the Gentiles, the Gentiles are being a witness to the Jews. And so literally these Jews who are displaced are literally being inspired because of what God did through Daniel and they are motivated. God is showing them, look at what I'm doing. And this chapter ends by connecting the reign of Darius with that of Cyrus. And and some translate this to being that the author is writing in this way to explain that the two names, Darius and Cyrus, belong to the same person. But that's, we don't know for sure. But regardless, Daniel was respected by Cyrus and continued to be a witness. He lived to see Cyrus issue the edict that permitted the Jews to return to their land, rebuild their temple. And he may have even been used by God to help bring this fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. You know, we have this reminder from this story in 1 Peter 4.19, where it says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. That's such a powerful verse for me because I think sometimes we can become so fixated on the opposition. We can, so, we can be so uh, consumed with how the cards are stacked against us. Oh, my family's like this, or, or my job is like this situation, or, or oh, like, like this is going on here, and, and these people don't like me, these people are talking about me, these people are saying this, I just got this email, or, or, or this person wants to meet, and it's that, and, and we literally get so consumed with this opposition that we miss out, like, like that if I'm, if I'm going to suffer while following Jesus, and, 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 I, and I walk through that, that means I give him control of the situation, and I choose to live obediently and for him, even through the trial. So in other words, when this trial happens, I have an opportunity, I have a choice, whether I'm going to shoulder this and be consumed with the opposition and live as a martyr, right? Like you don't see Daniel living as a martyr. Did you not, did you not see what happened? Like Daniel is thriving and being promoted in Babylon, okay? Babylon was not a Christian culture, right? Like he wasn't back in Jerusalem, Right? Their, their beliefs were in opposition to his beliefs. The, the cards were stacked against him, okay? Like, but we see even in this environment that Daniel is being promoted. He's given influence in all of this. He was not acting like this martyr. Oh, God, you took me here, and I'm stuck in this foreign land, and all these people are against you, and oh, my goodness. Like, no, he is absolutely consumed with living for God and continuing to live God's way when everybody else was in opposition to that, and even when that meant a trial and temptation, and that meant suffering.
if the lions had eaten Daniel, is God any less of a God? And I think that's a really important question for us. Is my relationship with God based on eternal deliverance or earthly deliverance? And, and, like, and, and how this plays out is, will I acknowledge his sovereignty if it works out? Will I only acknowledge his sovereignty if it only works out in my immediate favor or deliverance? In other words, we are very situational with our sovereignty of God. And, and, and we will put him right there when things are kind of working out in my favor. Or when I can see him tangibly delivering when I need him to deliver. What you actually see, though, what reveals your heart is, is when he's not delivering how you wish he would deliver. And it's in those moments that we actually see, is he actually sovereign over this in my heart? Is, is he in that seat? Or has that been replaced with, you're only sovereign if you deliver me from the lion's den? You're only sovereign if you make this right. You're only sovereign if you bring this person to my life. You're only sovereign if you make this pain, this situation, this person go away, God. Then you're sovereign. And we may not pray that way. We may not come here and sing that way and act that way. But I think for some of us, that's actually what's going on in our hearts. And we're angry at God. And we have all these doubts. And the doubts aren't even rooted from our belief that he is real. It's rooted in the fact that he has not come through for me the way I wanted to when I wanted him to. And, and, and I just got to tell you, that's dangerous. That does not mean he's sovereign. You're not giving him sovereignty over your life. And so we got to wrestle through that. You know, um, I think... I think one of the things that, that I ask is, what will define me, the opposition or the sovereignty of God? And if he is sovereign over any opposition, what is holding me back? You know, I remember the first time that I, uh, I faced like, you know, and, and here's the reality. Our opposition, it really is. When you look back at these things, man, my opposition, I, sometimes I'm like, God, thank you for this opposition. Because it's, it's, it's just not like, like what I read about. I'm, and, I, and I'm like, man, God, like, it could be so worse. It could be so much harder. And, and I, I remember kind of the first time, and I, I just started in ministry. I was a youth pastor. And, and I remember this parent literally wanted to kill me, was just lighting me up, like at church, which is awesome. Um, and, and I remember, and, and I was like, I had just taken this job, you know, like, rah, rah, God, and I'm here to help save all your youth in this town, and da 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 you know, and, and all this. And I just remember sitting there as this, like, this dad is just unloading on me. And it wasn't even, it wasn't, like, true. He didn't have, and, and, and I just remember, and now we're, like, really close. But he was just, <laughs> God's amazing. But he's just unloading on me. And I'm just, like, I'm fresh out of, like, like college and, I, and I'm just like just just like literally my soul is like why did I choose this career this is awful like I could totally like minister on the side like and 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 I'm just getting ripped to pieces and I remember like I, I went home and I wasn't married so it was even worse I'm like alone <laughs> God you know it's like I don't even have someone to cry with God <laughs> like and, and I go home, and some of you are like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> but I went home, and, and I remember one of those defining moments with God where, because I, I'm feeling everything. I'm like, man, I, maybe I'm, man, I shouldn't be here. Maybe I should quit. Maybe, maybe I should take a different job. Or maybe, like, like, yeah, maybe I just misread some of that and, and calling. And, and, and I was just so wounded from that conversation. I never felt that way when I thought I was doing what I was supposed to, and yet it turned out like that. And I just remember coming to the conclusion with God where he's just like, is that going to define your calling with me? What somebody who doesn't even know the truth is saying to you right now? Is that literally going to derail the fact that I am sovereign over all this and that I have called you to be here for such a time as this, are you really going to allow that to overwhelm and define you right now? And it was just one of those like moments with God. And I think we need to come to that reality. 
Because I think for some of us, we're, we, we, we literally thought by going all in with him that, that, that everything would just align if I followed him, if I just walk with him, if I just proclaim him, if I do these things. And in reality, you're going to get tagged. There's going to be something that happens. There's going to be opposition. I don't know if it's going to be physical. I don't know if it's going to be emotional. I don't know if it's going to be a person, a situation, a job, schooling. I, I don't know what it is, but I do know that if we're going to faithfully follow him, this stuff is going to happen in our lives, and it's in that moment we either see what my identity rests in, we either see is God really sovereign or is it a circumstantial sovereignty. And I just pray, I pray for us in this room that we would allow him to be sovereign because if he is sovereign in your life, you will be unbreakable, unshakable, and your outlook will define your outcome and it will be God's outcome. Amen. Let's pray.